So the next thing I want to talk about is, uh, again, by way of introduction, by way of just setting the stage, is a really, really important concept, which is um, knowing what was before, right? So what was the before like? So we have some different terms for this. We can call this sliding baselines or shifting baselines, but, but it all falls into the same, same idea, right? And so, so let me illustrate that with, uh, with some examples. Um, so I, I uh, do uh, various projects related oftentimes to, or it's not oftentimes, sometimes now. It used to be all the time, now it's sometimes. Um, ecological restoration, to restore something, right? To restore a grassland or a wetland, uh, that kind of thing. And so working on restoring something, by definition, restore it, right? So take it back to something, right? And so the question is, well, what's that back to? Where, 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 are, we, where are we flying the plane towards, right? And so one of the things I do when I was working on a grassland or a wetland, I would, I would go to the people that used to live there or work the, work the landscape or whatever and say, hey, man, what was, this, what was this place like back in the day? And so here's a quote this guy said to me uh, one time. He said, oh, it's so sad how things have changed. We need to go back to how things were when I was a kid. Okay, so that's one quote. Um, talking to some other people, talking to some scientists, hey, what should we, what should we um, so we want to restore this grassland. We, what do we want, want to restore it to? What's the goal? Uh, another example is this colleague said, oh, we want to restore it to pre-disturbance levels. Uh, what the hell does that mean? Okay, thanks, but I don't know, but all right. Um, and then another quote, I also, as another community member, I also feel it's a stupid argument to say that we shouldn't have to accept a North America that has changed. I kind of expect that. So we have all these different perceptions. Um, a couple other quotes also before we get going. This, these, are, these are not about conservation. These are more just general ones. But this is uh, the famous uh, physicist Richard Feynman said, the first principle, meaning of all science, he said the first principle is that you must not fool yourself and you are the easiest person to fool, right? So, so saying that we got to always check our own assumptions, right? Check our own uh, understanding first before we start pointing fingers at anybody else. And then here's one from uh, George Carlin, the comic. It says, the wisest man I ever knew taught me something I never forgot. And although I never forgot it, I never quite memorized it either. So what I'm left with is the memory of having learned something very wise and that I can't quite remember. I was hoping you guys would laugh at that, but obviously it's too early in the morning for <laughs> humor for you guys. Clearly, I need to go. I, I apparently need to go visual humor with you guys. Okay, so here we go. So here's my story. So, so um, this is so my son's a, a sophomore in college now. So this is a long time ago picture. But <clears throat> when he was born, uh, you know, we brought him home, and we used to have a clean house. I know those of you that come to my office would say, Doctor Anderson would never have a clean house. I don't have a clean house, but my wife has a clean house. So my offices are always uh, disasters. But nevertheless, we had, a, we had a relatively, we had a little teeny tiny house, relatively clean house, it was great. And then my son was born. And then all of a sudden, what became clean totally changed. So this became clean without even thinking about it. it this wasn't even a conscious thought. It was all of a sudden, this is clean. And people start coming over to our house. And we had, again, we had a small house. People are like, oh, where do I sit down? Like, let me, let me move the Legos, let me move the blocks, right, to find a place to, I can put my butt on a cushion, you know, kind of thing. And so this was the new, this suddenly became the new clean. Why is this the new clean? Because there aren't diapers all around. There isn't, there isn't baby poop and throw up and food containers all around, right? So therefore, it's clean, right? But what I consider, what we considered the standard of a, a clean place change before we even thought about it. I mean, it just all of a sudden, boom. Um, so yeah, so this is, this is the new claim uh, once my son was born. Um, we humans have been manipulating things for a long time. So this is uh, uh, Southern Europe. This is the, the, uh, the, the Alps near um, 
uh, uh, northern Italy, the, the, the no northern Italian border. And this is this you know, mountainous area, alpine area, snow and, and snow-capped peaks and stuff. So in 1991, some German tourists were hiking around, because they're Germans, so they have to hike everywhere. So they're hiking around, and it's you know, summertime, and they're, they're, they're going through some, you know, I don't know, with later hosen or something, drinking beer. I don't know what the hell they're doing. They're walking around. And they sit down next to this chunk of, chunk of snow, this, this, this cliff kind of area. And they're, they're having lunch or taking a snack or whatever. And uh, a guy looks over and, oh, oh my god, there's this half-frozen body, like sort of partially sticking out of this, this snowy area. And they're like, oh my god. And they try to go get the guy, but he's kind of frozen in there. So they grab the stick that's nearby, and they try to, they try to pry him out. They can't get him, they break the stick, can't, can't get him. They're like, oh my God, so they go and they call the cops, like, oh, it's, it's, you know, somebody must have gone missing last winter or something, right? Died, come get the authorities. Well, turns out it was not a just dead hiker. It was what we now call Otzi the Iceman. So this was an individual that died more than 5,000 years ago and it was, was essentially entombed in ice and snow and frozen up there for all this time. But he was fantastically well preserved by the, by the, the dry and the cold. Um, and so it turns out that stick that they grabbed to help prime out was his, was his bow or his walking stick. So it was like a 5,000 year old thing that just snapped. I'm like, well, you know, bad time. <laughs> so anyway, so now we have an actual muse an entire museum built around this one mummified uh, 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 human. And it's, it's, he continues to be this fantastic fount of information as to what people in southern Europe many thousands of years ago were like. And so now, so, that, so that's him in the bottom. He's in this climate controlled uh, chamber with inert gas so he doesn't, he doesn't you know, decay and all that kind of stuff. Um, but, uh, you know, I mean, obviously he's a little dead. You know, he's been taking those Zembeck or whatever how people <laughs> take these days. Um, but he doesn't look, he doesn't look 5,000 years dead, right? He looks like, you know, a couple years dead kind of thing. So really, really cool. So um, one of the things, uh, and, and again, people started studying this in the mid 90s and they haven't stopped. So we're, we're constantly learning new stuff. Um, and, and if you're, you're curious, there's all kinds of fantastic uh, nature documentaries and science documentaries and history documentaries about this guy, because this is very interesting. Um, so, what we think happened, what we think happened was this was a dude who was going from one area to another and was traversing the mountains, um, uh, you know, on, on a trip. We've learned a lot from what he had inside of him and what he had on his persons. So, for example, just a few examples. Um, uh, his feet, or excuse me, his, his shoes, so he had, he had these leather shoes. And then inside that leather was, were all these plants stuffed in there for insulation. So these were not local plants. These were not plants from the top of the mountain or from the summit or, or, or the, the grassy meadow. These are plants from you know, down by the ocean and, and far away. And so we could tell that this, that this guy was manipulating some of these things, right? But maybe those he just grabbed. But then there's other plants. So then, so then there's you know, his foot this insulation, then a leather uh, case or leather like outer foot. And then that's all held together with this thing, this woven um, um, cord. That's made of a different reed, a different plant that obviously has been selected and harvested specifically for its, its fibrous properties, right? So these guys are, he's gathering, he's sort of gathering some random stuff. Maybe it's just random, it would happen to be nearby. But then he's actively targeting some kind of stuff, and indeed another type of reed for his cape, for his cloak. And then when uh, he had a little pouch of food, and when they cut into his gut, found he was eating stuff like this, what we would call wheat, right? So cultivated plants. So plants that these humans, these thousands of years ago, were actively encouraging to grow, right? So they were either being planted or being irrigated or doing something. So already 5,000 years ago, humans in this area of the world were, were selectively harvesting certain things for construction materials, 
uh, influencing the cultivation of other food crops. And so even 5,300 years ago, we were actively manipulating, at least in our local environment, the, the plants and critters around us. And this has gone on. So here, let's jump to today. Let's talk about, for example, the Hawaiian Islands. So we talk about Hawaii, and that is, uh, we typically think of the quote unquote main Hawaiian Islands, the Big Island, Maui, Kauai, right? Those places, and that's obviously Hawaii. But in reality, Hawaii is this massive chain of islands that stretches out thousands of miles into the North Pacific. And so the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands are really, really awesome, and, but they don't have resident year-round people, except for a few scientists kind of, you know, uh, 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 sort of military listening stations. But there, are, there aren't cities and things of that nature up there. And so if we look at, um, you know, so we go to Hawaii and it's super cool and it's lush and we're like, oh my God, Hawaii's so awesome, it's super cool. It's highly manipulated, it's highly altered. We highly alter it, the Polynesians first massively altered it when they arrived, 600 odd years ago. Um, uh, and so, um, anyway, so, so, but lo so let's look, let's, let's contract, let's, take the same time period, but let's just see what happens when we look at a place with people and a place without people, right? Kind of roughly sort of the same, same environment, same sort of weather patterns and stuff. And what we see is, what we see is um, in the, so over here on this left column, I have the main Hawaiian Islands, what, we, what most people think of as Hawaii. And then I have the Northwestern, uh, far away, um, hard to get to, not a lot of people living there islands. So our main islands are, are, are heavily overfished um, and our no northwestern islands are mostly in a state of reserve, a protected area, which we will talk about later in the semester, um, and they are unfished. So we have much more diverse populations of fish up there. Uh, on the main islands, we have pretty intense human development with you know, millions of folks in the, in the um, near shore environment. And all of these uh, atolls and these, these, these necklaces of islands, there's less than a, a hundred year round people living in, in all of those islands. Um, really, really dictated by land-based impacts. One of our colleagues just sent us a photo, it just rained last week. She just sent us photos of the eroding beach right in front of us, um, just, just from this current rain event um, that happened last week. So we have this land-based impact, erosion, pollution, runoff, that kind of stuff. The Northwestern um, Hawaiian Islands don't have a lot of steep mountains and they don't have a lot of humans messing with the soils. So there really isn't much, of, much runoff at all into those uh, near shore ecosystems. And we have a lot of non-native exotic species, which again is another topic we'll talk about in this class. Um, uh, in this case, this is this uh, uh, invasive algae that's building up in the um, intertidal and washing up on beaches. and. Uh, over here, we have things like the endangered Hawaiian monk, monk seal that are relatively abundant up there. So, so compare and contrast where, where the human footprint is heaviest, we have these very changed systems. Where the human footprint is lighter, we have more robust systems, more diverse, more abundant critters, things of that nature. And so why this matters is, for example, a, an, the example of a, of a conservation biology question or, or, or or thing we're trying to work on is, hey, how many fish should be here? Okay, we get it, people are polluting, yeah, people are bad, uh, but what should be the goal be? What's a healthy amount of fish, right? So let me orient you. So we'll do a lot of graphs in this class. We'll do a lot of data looking at and exploring and, and talking about, right? So let me orient you first to this graph. So here on the left axis right here on this, uh, y-axis is fish biomass. So this is the, the, the total amount of fish tissue, which is one way to measure how much fish are out in the ocean. Okay? And this is in metric tons per hectare, so this is standardized per unit area. On the x-axis here are these different, different areas we're going to sample and talk about. Um, these bars, as you can tell from right here, I've told you, these are, this is the mean the top of the bar is a mean, and then this is plus or minus one standard error. 
So we have a, a mean and a variance with these plots, okay? And so we have a couple different areas. So first, let's look at um, uh, on the main Hawaiian Islands. So let's, let's call it Oahu. And we'll say, okay, so what if we had people fishing in Oahu, doing, fishing however much they want to fish? Yep, get a fishing license and go for it. I've, I can uh, tell you all kinds of stories about all these things, but I won't because we'll be here for weeks and weeks. But, but if you want me to tell you a story of, of fishing permits in Hawaii, I'll tell you a story about fishing permits in Hawaii later. Um, but so anyway, so this is get your fishing permit and then just go fish. Cool. Then we have some areas that we have seasonal closures. Say, hey, you guys, let's not fish during these types, th these times of the year or under these conditions or whatever. Okay, cool. So we call that a partial fishery closure. Okay. Now you and I are going to go put on some scuba tanks, we're going to go jump in the water, and we're going to go count the fish. So we go count the fish. It turns out, when we look at these areas that have unlimited access to people can fish there as much as they want, and then we go to areas that are supposed to be closed for some period of time, that there's no difference. And also, let me just make sure we're all on the same page here. So I'm showing significant difference here with dissimilarity, which is very common. So dissimilarity of letters. So if the letter is the same between any two columns, those columns are not statistically significantly different from one another. If the letters differ, then those two columns are statistically significantly different. Does that make sense? Everybody with me? Okay. So, so these first two are the letter C. So therefore, they're not statistically significant. So the, the fish, whatever the heck you want, and only fish sometimes, same amount of fish in those areas. Then we have some other areas where nobody is ever allowed to fish ever. So just, it's not the right season or with the right fishing gear, it's just like, hey, nobody can ever go in here and take any of these fish. That we do see is different. We do find that actually, in fact, there, there are more, there's more biomass there. Okay, cool. Under the normal condition, that's what you and I have to work with. In most conservation biology contexts, that's what we have. And so we go together and we go to the public meeting and we, we get some, a, a grant and we go measure the stuff and then we go you know, give public testimony and talk to the agency and say, ah, oh, the answer is we should have something a little bit south of two metric tons of fish biomass per hectare of reef. That, that would be a healthy reef, that would be good. But in the case of Hawaii, we actually have these, the northern Hawaiian islands, the northwestern Hawaiian islands. So if we actually get another grant and we get a boat with our scuba tank and we drive up there, ride the boat up there and jump out in the reef and we count, we get a lot more. Oh, look at that. One, two, two, three. Holy crap. What a horrible figure that is. That's like something you'd see on like Fox News or something. Okay, so, so, this, so th this should be three and this is four. So this should actually be about more than three metric tons. So in fact, this, this no-take reserve is better than these guys, but it's, it, it itself, our best reference is already tweaked, right? Is already impacted by people. Even if we're, we're now being cool, we have this legacy of historic impact. So again, figuring out what should be here or what is the goal, it's a non-trivial thing. It's really, really important, but it's a non-trivial thing. Okay, cool. Um, all right, let's turn to look at a little closer to home. So let's look at, uh, let's say our, our Sierra forests, Sierra Nevada. This is what our forests uh, look like now. Well, now, now they're probably in snow, but if we were in the, fall semester, it would probably look like this, like around Halloween or something like that, right? So, so a lot of trees, a lot of shrubs, all that kind of good stuff. So this looks like, you know, it's a cool forest and everything. There's, there's birds around and, and all that kind of cool stuff. Okay, so now we're going to go to, pretend, pretend like we're going to the eye doctor. I'm going to show you two things. And you guys have to, you're going to have to say A or B. So if, you've, if you're sleeping through my boring lecture here, you have to wake up. You have to vote. So no lame people where you like kind of put your hand up like, like half an inch. So you have to vote. You're going to vote either for A or for B. Okay. So I want to know which one is a healthier community. So, this, so I'm going to show you A and B. So here you go. Here's A. 
Here's B. It's the same place. It's the same, same location, different time. So this one, A, is this healthier ecosystem? Or B, is this healthier? So A, B, A, B. Okay. So who says A, raise your hand. And you got to raise high, really high. Okay. One, two, wait. Uh, okay. Wait, but, but you got to, if you guys, yeah, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. no, I totally know you don't know, but you got to make a guess. So you're not going to get anything wrong. Don't worry. You're not going to be great on this. But so you either have to say A or you have to say B. So don't wimp out. Okay. So this is A. Okay. So who says A? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19. So just about everybody. And then, and then who said the opposite? Okay. All right. Now, uh, so tell me, so who said A and tell me why a couple reasons why you guys thought A is the healthier community. And again, no, no wrong here. Just, we'll just, let's just, yeah, please. Okay. R totally. More trees. There's more trees here, dude. Of course, man, this is healthy. Other, other thoughts or other arguments for this one? Okay. And, and so therefore you think this one, so this one, this one is one more filled in. Okay. So we have more trees. We have more biomass. Oh yeah. No, yeah. 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 Well, for first, so any more, any more, more arguments for a, okay. How about people that thought B? So what are some of the arguments for B? The more trees there are, the less resources there are for younger trees. So that means that there's not as much biodiversity and there's not as healthier trees there. And that's why B is healthier because there's more space for younger trees be to become older trees. Okay, so the argument is maybe it's not just biomass. Maybe it's not just bulky stuff, but maybe it's the types of stuff that are there, the types of critters that are there. Caleb? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, 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 so maybe, maybe this is there's more dynamic things going on in yeah. this in this B. Not maybe. Just like but also like biodiversity as well. Other things. So, 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 okay, so, so heterogeneity differences. It's not all uh, a monoculture. There's some like blankness and some riverness and some treeness and all that kind of stuff. Those are technical terms, also, by the way. Okay. So here's the answer. So the upper left one, which is the one that didn't have as, much, as many trees, was 1874. The, one, the A that had a lot of stuff was 1964. The same picture was taken in 1994. Now we can't take, well, I don't know now, but I should have checked. But as of about six, seven years ago, I couldn't show you any more pictures because you couldn't see anything because it was solid trees. So I couldn't take a picture, you couldn't take a picture of the valley. So we've gone from sparse trees back in the day to thicker trees to now massively dense trees. So this picture on the right is a little blurry because it's just a small picture that I blew up and there isn't, there isn't a higher resolution. This is a, a um, illustration from one of John Muir's uh, uh, publications arguing for the protection of Yosemite and those kind of things, the founding of the Sierra Club. Have a look at it. Stare up here for a second. This is John Muir. When John Muir rode into Yosemite, because of the land management of the native peoples there, right, they were actively burning, frequently burning the meadow. Because of that management, that active manipulation of vegetation, and also natural wildfires. When John Muir rode in, as he is right now, he's on, a, he's on horseback, he did not duck. His horse walked into what he described as a park-like environment. So there, there was, the horse wasn't tripping on shrubs. There wasn't a thousand million little tufted trees over here or whatever. It was, it was open. Why? Because this area was frequently burning and all of that undergrowth, those small little shrubs, those little grasses, they burned up, or if not every year, fairly frequently. So 
it never could get to look like this because this would be caught on fire. And the small trees would burn up, but the big, the big honking trees that have evolved with fire would get scarred, they'd get black, they'd get charred, but they wouldn't die. And, they'd, and then after the fire would be mellowed, then they'd just keep go back to growing. So, so sometimes our perceptions can lead us astray, right? So we, we tend to think, oh my gosh, lots of trees, trees good, lots of fish, fish good, or, or, or whatever it is, right? Green, green good. Like, ah, but again, we have to, be, we have to check our assumptions. And that, 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 that's not to say you guys were stupid for falling for that. I do this all the time. We all do this all the time. We have to make sure we know what we know. How? Why do I think this is good? Why do I think this is the desirous state? Or why do I think the state used to be like this? And now, and now we look like this, right? Now everything's burning on fire because we have all this massive fuel buildup. So um, here is uh, uh, a data, I'll show you a couple of figures here. So this is um, data from an experimental, super well-managed uh, forest in, in um, Western Arizona. Uh, very, very well studied. So this is um, uh, data from a dendrochronology lab. That's a lab that studies tree rings. Okay, so let me orient you here. Here's, here's time. So this is 1600s. This is back in the day. And this is modern time, right? So we're going from back in the day to now on the x-axis. On the y-axis, this one is number of trees. And then this red thing here is um, number of significant fires. What do we mean by significant fire? It means we, and so, I apologize, let me make sure I explain. So, so tree ring, studying tree rings, we essentially take a big metal straw or big metal drill with a hollow center and we drill it into the center of the tree. And because most of these types of trees, right, so these are di dicots, so this is not a palm tree, it doesn't work with a palm tree, but for these types of trees, they, they lay down a layer every year. So there's a time of year when it's really, really fast growing, and then a time of year when they grow slowly. So when they grow slowly, the cells uh, uh, are really close to each other and they make a dark band. When they're growing really fast, they're a light color. So that's what gives us the wood grain, right? The, the, the sort of banding when we do a cross section of a, of a tree. And so we can jam that straw in down to the core, pull it out, and then we can count the number of lines, right? And that's uh, basically, that, those are mostly annual growth rings. And then if there was a big fire on the outside, it would be charcoal -y. It would be sort of crispy, it would be blackish, you know, carbon-y kind of thing. Um, and so, so we can do that with a tree that's old. And then sometimes that tree falls down, boom, but doesn't rot. And then we can, we can actually sort of by doing a crosswalk, we can use long dead trees matched up with living trees and we can actually go back in time. Um, so there's all kinds of neat techniques, but we don't have time to go into all that. But the point is this, right? Back in the day, we had definitely had trees in this place, but we always had a few trees, right? A few trees. Sometimes there's a few less, sometimes there's a few more, but there's a lot of few trees. And crap loads of fire, very frequent fire. Fire, 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 fire. Not every single year, but pretty, pretty, pretty frequently. And then something massive happens around 1900 and the big fires stop. And then the trees go, yeah. technical term is ape shit. So there's all kinds of trees. So what happened in 1900? Any guesses? Oh, great question. So did we, did we ban the practice of Native American starting of fires? No, we actually started that in the 1800s when we started committing genocide and getting rid of these folks. So that had already started a little bit. Um, or, 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 or changing that level of fire had already started a little bit. But there's something even more massive that happens. It's a good guess, but there's something else. Yeah. Oh, close. So the question is, could it be national parks? So the very first national park, Yellowstone, um, uh, 1781, uh, or 70, sorry, 1782, what did I say? Oh my God, my historian mentor would be very angry with me to say that. Um, anyway, um, so, so uh, 
uh, Yellowstone, our first national park, uh, right around this time. Um, sort of related, but it's not. Is that yeah. like Theodore Roosevelt and all the protections coming about? Yes, but a specific one. Oh. U.S. Forest Service is created. The Park Service, the Park Service, like we're talking about, um, is about, hey, we're going to save this land and we're going to interpret and preserve all this history and all this kind of good stuff and, and, you know, da 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 da. The Forest Service, when we go onto a Forest Service property, Los Padres by up, by us, Angeles National Forest, well, what does the sign say when we drive onto a Forest Service property? What's that? No campfires. No campfires, good. Absolutely. But there's a slogan that they say on every single land of many uses. It says land of many uses. And so the Park Service, uh, we'll go more, we'll talk about this more when we get to the history lecture. So I'll, I'll skip it I'll, real quick. Suffice it to say, the idea here is fire was considered evil now. Fire was bad. So the idea, the idea of, of, of manipulating was right. But even wildfires, even natural fires that start, don't let that burn. Don't let that burn. And so we actively began a policy of active fire suppression. So whether it was a, a car, whether it was a campfire, whether it was a lightning strike, whatever, it's bad. And then we create Smokey the Bear. And Smokey the Bear is propaganda to get rid of fire, right? We'll talk about all this, but, but so, so, um, so that's what's going on here. So we actively chose a radically different way to manage our forests than we ever had in human history in the US starting around 1900. And this is, this is a wider view across the Western US. <clears throat> Again, 1600 to 2000 and, uh, and so, um, so this, this is a bit of a complex figure. I'll just sh show you guys. Is this okay? Do you guys, would you guys like the lights totally off? Is this, is, can you guys re read the screen okay here? Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay. All right. So um, um, yeah, we don't have to spend much time here. Suffice it to say, this are uh, punctuated by big fires. Big fire here. 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 And then we enter this post-1900 world, and those big fires basically go away. Until about now. Now we have so much fuel that we can't keep up. So now we're starting into this new era of lots of fire all over the place. In addition to that, and so this is like most of our conservation challenges. Most of our conservation challenges are not one-parted. They're, they're multiple things coming together. So that's the first part. The first part is, hey man, stop, stop fires. Stop, stop the natural process. Fire is a natural part of this ecosystem. Even though native people's burnt, even though we burn, some fire is supposed to be here, right? It should be here. It's a, just like we should have water and just like we should have predators, we should have fire in these western systems. <clears throat> so that's going on. <clears throat> then we add climate change in there. <clears throat> then we add the massive change in snowpack. And so this is <clears throat> the long-term average of snow in the Eastern Sierras. So the, the more wider, the, the more intense, the, the brightness of the color, that's the more average amount of snow. This is what snow was like um, in sort of the basically middle part of our last big drought, right? We're into this, this second new crazy drought now, but, but the last big drought. And these are all showing percentage changes in rainfall. Basically, everything's getting drier and drier and drier. All across California, things are getting drier and drier and drier. These, these are dead trees. And the darker the color, the more dead trees, we standing dead trees. So one that's because of drought, also it's because of bark beetles, an organism that naturally occurs with our trees. And, and, and attacks the tree, and a healthy tree with a lot of water and really robust is going to get bitten by a beetle, <clears throat> flood that biting area with sap, and kind of you know, uh, uh, kind of ooze 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 away that that beetle. 
because <clears throat> of climate change, these critters are not able to complete one life cycle each year, but two and sometimes three rounds of life cycles. So these populations are exploding. They're insanely abundant. And they're overpowering the tree's ability to resist them. And the trees have less water, so they can make less sap. So it's all this stuff coming together. So it's all this stuff coming together that's leading to this massive change. So now we're in this era of increasingly large wildfires. So not only are we seeing these, these fires happen, but the scale that they're happening is massive. These massive fuels are going crazy. Here in our own backyard, <clears throat> this is the footprint, this light gray is the footprint of the Thomas fire uh, scar. Around it are the burn scars of other fires just prior to the Thomas fire. And so what you see is everything basically burns. Right, and and so this is a <clears throat> excuse me a natural <clears throat> a natural uh, goings on, <clears throat> um, but what, what's happening is the return rates of these fires are changing. So this is the Santa Monica Mountains. So here's us. So campus is right here. Here we are. Boop boop boop. Here's the Santa Monica Mountains. Now the Santa Monica Mountains also burn just like the Sierras. So that, you know fire is supposed to be here. However. Another thing is happening here. So again, this is, this is all trying to figure out the shifting baselines. Like what, what should we have? What's the right amount of fire, right? What's the right amount of trees and this and that? So we just talked about removing fire is really bad and causes problems. The opposite is happening in San, this, for us here in the Santa Monica's. Here, we're starting way too many fires. So here, what we call the fire return rate means for any one acre, okay, it burns. And then how long does it take for the next fire to come through? In our part of the world here, we estimate after a lot of research that it's about 20-ish years is probably the right amount of return for our, our coastal sage scrub communities here in the Santa Monica Mountains. So fire happens, and on average, you know, it's not always 20 years, sometimes it's 15, sometimes it's 30, but on average, it's about 20-ish years is when we'd expect, before we started manipulating this landscape, we would get more fire. But check this out. So this is the fire return rate, right? So as we get hotter and as we get more, um, uh, so, so the purple and, and blues are, the, are the, what I talked about, which is like sort of the background, quote unquote, natural, quote unquote, before people started actively screwing with stuff return rate. But then we have some areas, check them out here, right down by the coast, green, green, yellow, orange, red, right? Some of those eight year fire return. So we get a fire every eight years on average in some of these places, right? What's going on there? Humans. Humans are in there. Um, sometimes there's a-hole humans that are arsonists that are actively trying to start fires, but it's also just people's Tesla pulled off the side of the road or a spark from somebody doing some landscaping or, or whatever, right? And so, so all these things make it complex. Yeah? Are these all unintentional when you start fires? Uh, mostly unintentionally. I mean, th this would also, if, if someone was an arson and started it, we would, that would go in here too. But most of this is, is not people, is, is not arson. Oh, oh, correct. Oh, yeah, yeah, like control burns. We do almost no control burns. Cool. Okay, and then even campus here is burned. So all of campus burned up in 2013 in the Springs Fire. The only reason why campus still exists here is because we had 500 firefighters physically on campus actively fighting the fire. Um, so uh, it started on, on, the, on the grade by the 101 and and was campus was evacuated by 10 o'clock and all of campus is on fire by the afternoon. Um, so it was amazing that we lost a couple outbuildings and some landscaping and stuff, but, but that we didn't actually lose any main buildings. It was, it was crazy. Um, and then uh, here we go. Here's, here's uh, uh, PCH during the Woolsey fire, right? That's not how it's supposed to look. We're not supposed to have these massive columns of flame. Um, and so climate change, again, is, is exacerbating all these things, making it harder to figure out what should our baseline be, right? Um, and so for the Woolsey fire, 
if you were in Simi and wanted to go surf, Simi Valley, right, you'd get on the 23 and 23 and you'd, you'd come to the 101 and then get on Decker Canyon or whatever. You know, we're talking, if you're, if you're hauling it, that's like a 40 minute drive, 40, 43 minute drive, something like that, to go from Simi Valley to the beach in Malibu. This fire got there in less than two hours. So it was almost as fast as you could drive, which is crazy, fueled by Santa Ana winds. So, so the scale at which we need to adapt our conservation biology tools is very fast, right? We don't have the luxury of hanging around because this is, this is what we're getting. And when, when all the wealthy, powerful folks in Malibu get pissed off and want change, something's gonna happen, right? And, uh, and so it could be that, it could be George Floyd protests, it could be whatever. The, the pressure people are demanding in various quarters when stuff really goes south, they want an answer now. They do not want to say, I want to give you money for 25 years to go study the problem. You know, maybe if you're lucky, they'll say, we'll give you a year to figure it out. But, but we really need to come up with these solutions uh, quickly as well. And so we're starting to see the entire shift of, of the composition of, of things like maples in eastern forests. Um, pandemic, we'll skip over that. Houston, um, yeah, we'll skip over that too for now. Um, um, okay, so talk about shifting baselines. Here we go. Let's, let's look at uh, another California example before we, we, we uh, wrap up this, this intro to concepts. So here is... Um, a, a picture from the Atascadero Historical Museum, so by Cal, Cal Poly, by San Luis Obispo. This is from the early 1900s, uh, wait, this might be like, no, I think this is like late 1800s, very late 1800s. So the caption on this was something like, uh, clearing the fields for, you know, for the farm, right? Look at that oak tree, that's a valley oak. Look, look how big that dude is, and look, how, look at the diameter of that tree. This tree is at least, at least 200, 250 years old, at least. And that thing's massive, right? So <clears throat> I, uh, before, before, I was, before I came down to help start CSUCI, I was up at Stanford University. And one of the things I did was, was in, I was in charge of uh, um, working on restoring this landscape. So this landscape is very similar to like Santa Paula, Agoura Hills, uh, uh, you know, the, hill, the Ojai kind of area, kind of rolling grasslands kind of thing, rolling hills kind of stuff with some steep, steep hills around it. And so um, I'm trying to figure out what we should do with this area, right? And so I grew up in California. I grew up with this stuff um, and I, I grew up seeing this kind of stuff. I was like, woo, that's like really, I look, you know, driving the car, look off the side of the, uh, on the side of the road. That looks really cool, man. There's, a gra there's grass there. There's no Walmart parking lot, right? There's no giant skyscraper. It's like, that's pretty cool, right? It's got grass, awesome. It's all invasive grass from Europe and Asia. But anyway, but anyway, but, but, but it's got grass. Okay, cool. I didn't know that at the time. Okay, cool, grass is cool. And it's got trees. Trees are cool. I like trees. Trees are cool. Who doesn't like trees? You don't like trees, you're an asshole. So these are cool, right? And it's like, oh, it's a nice pretty tree. And then over the, over the hill is another nice pretty tree. That is what I grew up to think of as natural, as good, as healthy, as, as, as the thing that we want, right? So one of the things I'm working on at Stanford is this, is this endangered salamander. And this endangered salamander lives in, uh, needs seasonal wetland, lives in the grasslands sometimes a year. And then when, when uh, is very particular, it has to be uh, a fall night, has to be nighttime, there can't be a moon out, has to be stars out, but no moon out, has to be slightly raining, and somebody playing Barry White. No, the Barry White thing's not true. And so, but if those things happen, if those things happen, the, the, the males and females come out of the grassland and they go to the local wetlands and they breed, which is great. That, they've done this for, forever. These are California tiger salamanders. Super cool. Awesome. Um, the problem is they, we have roads all around. And so a lot of times when they go from the grassland to the wetland, at least when I started, they had to go across this road and they would get squished. And that's not good. And so, so I'm trying to figure out what to do. And, and so, 
So there's this place called uh, Lagunita. Actually, in classic Stanford speech, it was Lake Lagunita. So it's Lake Lake. It's, yeah, so <laughs> excellent, good. That, that's, called, that's called culturally responsive naming. But anyway, um, so, so uh, I was trying to figure out what's go going on. And people are like, oh, this lake's been here. And, you know, da -da 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 -da. <clears throat> and I'm looking for evidence of what it used to be like back in the day. And I have some journal entries and stuff, but I can't, can't find anything else. I'm like, OK. And so one day, I go to the library, and I'm looking for some stuff. And uh, it, it's great. Uh, like Old universities have fantastic libraries. I love libraries, and I love old libraries. I love the smell of old books for some reason. I don't know why, but it's like, this is cool. It's like Harry Potter kind of thing. <laughs> uh, and, um, and the Stanford Library was awesome. So, I could just walk in and there's like, there's a book from like 1850 that I could like literally just pull off the shelf myself and check out. I didn't have to go through some special procedure or leave a deposit. I'm like, whatever. So they have all these great archives. So I'm looking around for a long time, see if I can find anything. Can't find anything. And one day I go, hey, can you ask the librarian, can you pull this, this folder out of this, or can you get, get this thing from this, this reference cabinet? So she does. And she pulls it out and she said, oh, this thing was stuck back there. So there was this old manila folder from like the 1920s or 30s or something. And, uh, and, and it, was, it was unlabeled, I'm just, so I opened it up, and it was a series of these eight photographs, this thing right here. And so it's hard to tell from just this, this flat display, but what someone did was they went out and they happened to go out to right where I was working in this area, Lagunita, and they took a camera and they pointed it north. This is the kind of camera the you know, dude puts it, the cape over his head and puts the plate in, right? So these are like really, really um, uh, high resolution photos from back in the day. And takes a pic, turns his compass, points the compass north, takes a picture, boom. And then turns it a little bit northeast, boom, picture. And then east. And so, so I don't remember which one is which. I can't quite read it here, but like this, you know, west, southwest. So each, so this is a wraparound. This is a, this is a, a, a VR. This is like virtual reality, circa 1886, right? So the guy made a 360 photograph essentially, and that was awesome. And I was like, what? And I was like, so for like a day, I couldn't like, Oh my god, I know what it looked like in 1886. And people are like, what the fuck? I don't care. I'm like, yeah, but look at it's like 1886. And so from this we were able to take a, a lot of inspiration and it really helped us understand how much the baseline had shifted. It had changed so much more than I thought it had. Because, again, when we walk around there now, it kind of looks like this, right? Kind of looks, kind of looks something like that, right? And so, uh, but this is, so actually, let, let me, let's take a quick pause. Let's take a quick uh, 60 seconds. And I'm going to turn the lights out so you can see this a little better. You guys stare up here and see if you can read the landscape from, from this photo. And I've, I've blown up these three panels in the bottom so it's just a little bit clearer. The, and, and this is looking towards the main part of the wetland, the, the sort of the shallowest part of the Lagunita kind of thing. Okay, so, so it'll take 60 seconds. Stare up here and see what you can glean from the landscape. Okay, what do we think? What do we think in here? What, what, what do you guys, uh, any, any insights or, or thoughts or initial guesses? It looks dry. Oh, sorry, Eddie, good. Okay, it looks dry. Okay, it looks dry. So, yeah, so this is, this is uh, sometime, maybe, probably like some late spring or summer, early fall, something like that. So it's not, there's not a, a accumulated water on the ground. So, okay, good, good. What else? Caleb? Ah, good thing. So, so something about the grass. So Caleb said it looks shrubby-like or whatever. Um, hold that thought. So excellent, good. That's one of the key observations. Other, other thoughts or other guesses or, or suggestions. It kind of looks like the lake is just like put there. Like maybe not like natural. It's not natural. Okay, so it looks like there's maybe been some manipulation yeah. going on type of thing. Okay, good. Excellent. Anything else? Compared to, compared to this one? Yeah. 
Uh, okay, good. Yeah, so check it out. So there's there's definitely trees on this hillside over here. There's definitely uh, more trees, totally. Uh-huh, good. I'll, I'll note that right here, there aren't that many trees, though, right, in the foreground, but, but, but good. So we have something about the ground. We have something that looks kind of maybe manipulated. We have something about the number of trees. Anything else? Okay, cool. So this is what uh, we took away. Um, Stanford University was called the, f the, the nickname for the campus is called The Farm because it was Leland Stanford's farm originally. And then he d turned the property over to, to become a university. So, so, you know, as it's being, and, and so it turns out this, this was part of the survey. So, so Stanford had a lot of juice. So instead of just calling up some random dude and saying like, hey, can we make a university? Um, he called up Frederick Law Olmsted, who's probably the most famous landscape architect in American history. He's the guy that designed Central Park. He designed Griffith Park in, in Los Angeles. Just like, he was a dude. And so he came out and he basically said, uh, oh, and Stanford said, build me a university to honor my son. And he's like, okay. And he said, hey, make me something impressive. And so, so in the hills, the rolling hills above the farm, the farm is on the flatland, most part. Uh, Olmsted said, oh, let's build this giant university up in hills, right? It would visually it would have been awesome. It would have sucked to have been a student because all day long you'd be walking up and down nonstop. Up, 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 down, 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 down. And sweaty, 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 sweaty. So Stanford saw that and was like, are you high? Like, no way, dude. We're gonna build on the flatland because it's cheaper and it's easier and simple and blah, blah, blah. So when he said, we've got to move down the flatland, that's when this photo was taken. So these guys went out essentially to survey and, and they took photos of various places. But this was the part that was, this was the one that was interesting to me. So already, before we even, so normally I think of this. Look at this, right? Oh, it's so messed up now maybe or whatever, but back in the day it was great, right? Yeah, it's so sad how things have changed. We need to get back how, th how things were when I was a kid, right? Because back then things were rocking and rolling. Now we're evil. But when I was a kid, it was so great, right? Mostly that's bullshit. So, so this is long before anybody was a kid. This is when somebody's great grandpa was a kid. Great grandma was a kid, right? This landscape is way more effed up than our current landscape. Let me say that again. 1886, this wetland, way more degraded than right now. Even though we have Silicon Valley, even though we have all these venture capitalists and freeways, this is a death zone. What do I mean by that? So when Caleb said, oh, the grass looks funky, there is no grass. If you look, that's actually dirt. The cattle density was stocked so high that all the grass is completely gone. It's massively overgrazed. So what we're seeing are not little tufts of grass. We're seeing like dried mud, right? Because it's been obliterated. Um, yes, it's true. Up on the hillsides, there are, are, are a good amount of oak trees, totally. But right here in the flatland where there should be oak trees, there's none. They've all been cleared. They've been actively cut down. Why? Because the farmers think that that's bad for grass. So the, the trees, one, shade, but two, the trees need a lot of water. And so the, if the trees take up the water, so goes the thinking, there's not enough water for the grass. So the reason these guys are clearing this is partly to you know, just physically be able to drive around the, or move around the landscape, but it's also because these trees are in the way, right? Let's get rid of these things and, and so we can have just our pure crops or whatever. And then another indication that there's way, way, way too many cattle on this landscape are all of these trees we see here. These are not oak trees. These are not natural oak trees growing like natural oak trees. These look like mushroom caps. 
So if you go to a system that has the natural, that has, has the, you know, non-disturbed amount of oak trees, there's branches on the ground and there's this and there's that. Everything here is totally cleared because why? The cattle density is so high, the cattle have come up and either one, munched the branches off because they're hungry, or two, the cows are like, and just like shoving, you know, scratching their back and they've snapped off all the branches. So this is very, very common in a, in a high stocking density area. Also, okay, so, anyway, so, so that's what's going on. So this landscape from 1886 is, was way more degraded. So the idea of we should make it back how where my grandpa was a kid, no effing way. That is not a good target, right? So the past was not a good guide. The, the, my assumption of the past was not a good guide, right? We, don't, we aren't always blessed with these awesome photographs that just are in the perfect spot that, sort of, that you find in the back of the filing cabinet, right? We oftentimes have to work on this our, on our own, and it's a challenge and it's hard, but it's a key part of the story. So what we now know, what I now know as the dude that now has learned a lot about grasslands and stuff, farmers went on probably to this property and they cleared off much of the oak trees. They left a few. Why? Because in the super, super hot summertime, the cows start to get hot. So they want a few shady spots, right? And so they'll leave a few. So again, what I viewed as a natural landscape, I now see is a massively shifted baseline. That is not the target. That is not the desirous thing. That is, that is a highly changed thing that I assumed was healthy when in fact it was degraded. Um, and so, so I mean, I'll, there's so many problems here, but just one quick one is if all we have are mature oak trees and we don't have any babies coming up, what's going to happen when that one tree falls over or gets hit by lightning or gets hit by a car or something, right? There's no more, no more trees in the population to keep things going, keep, keep, keep the tree landscape going. So shifting baselines, we all experience that implicitly, explicitly sometimes, we need to really, really check those when we talk about um, uh, co our conservation uh, uh, thoughts, our conservation planning. What should this be? How much has this system changed? And it's non-trivial. It's non-trivial. If you like puzzles, this is an awesome discipline to be in because everything we have is puzzles. So if, if you don't like sussing out who murdered who in the glass onion, this maybe isn't as, as, as great a discipline for you. But if you do like a challenge and puzzles, this is a fantastic uh, uh, career to get into. Okay, so then, uh, well, that looks really lame and, and not organized correctly. I should have fixed those slides. Um, anyway, um, so ju just as an example to wrap this up before we close up this lecture, let's talk about the scale at which we're talking about, right? So we've talked about grasslands. Let's talk a little bit about the scale of change. So here we go. I have grasslands right here. I have oak woodlands right here, oops, and I have wetlands right here. Uh, I have for California wide, and then I have the San Francisco Bay Area, because that's where I first, that's where I made these calculations, but also we have just very good data for the San Francisco Bay Area, so it's a data-rich environment, because San Francisco was there for a long time, and, and the settlements were there for a long time. Okay, so anyway, so, so this is my best estimate, based on a whole bunch of data sources, as to what's going on. So California, okay, so, so this, is the this is the story, this is the story of what's happened to our terrestrial landscapes in California. And in fact, many places around the world, but we'll just talk about California. So we had all this awesome stuff in the flatland. Uh, the European colonizers come in and they say, ah, flatland's cool, why? It's flat, it's easy to work with, blah, 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 blah. I'm gonna I'm go there. So our farms, our businesses, our railroads, all that kind of stuff. Houses, first, boom, flatland. And then we're on the flatland. Okay, cool. And then, uh, hey, let's get, some of those, uh, let's get some of those trees, those oak woodlands, which tend to be just on the hillsides. Let's chop those guys down for, few, for food, for fuel, for structure. And so, and so we, we tend to nuke the flat grasslands, nuke the oak woodlands, and the grasslands get displaced up the hillsides a bit more than they were. And the oak woodlands kind of get displaced up into where the more forests were, et cetera. So we've, we've both 
destroyed habitat, but we've also, we've also uh, uh, made, it, made it shift a bit. Okay, so this, this is the best data I've pulled together. So for cow, and this is, and so let's talk about roughly, essentially um, early 1800s to now. So that, that's sort of our, our comparison on that order of magnitude. 18, 1850, if you wanna pick like the, the, the state founding of California, but about that. So something, and these are estimates, right? So these are not exact numbers, but these are best guesses. So we have lost something like a third of the grasslands that, and this is just aerial extent. It's not saying that they're all healthy and kick butt and robust, but this is just saying the absolute area. We've lost about a third of the grasslands that used to exist in California. In an area like the San Francisco Bay Area, and I only use that it's not because we don't live there, but, but just as an example of a smaller area where we have higher resolution data, so these are just the counties that touch the, the San Francisco Bay. We've lost about two thirds of the historic grasslands. If we talk about grasslands that have a significant percentage of native grassland species, we've lost 93% of those. If we want to talk about oak woodlands, California, very, very hard to estimate the historic distribution. But we've lost at least 10% of the oak woodland acreage that used to exist back in the day. Again, an area where we have higher resolution data and we have much higher confidence, we estimate we've lost about 71% of the oak woodlands that used to exist. Okay. If we talk about wetlands, we in California have the dubious distinction of leading the U.S. in the percentage of historic wetlands that we've lost. We've lost 91% of our historic wetlands in California. In the Bay Area, we've lost about 95% of our historic wetlands, right? So I, I say this not to bum you out, but to, we, have, we have to understand the scale of the problem before we can start talking about solutions, right? But, but this, is the, this is what we're talking about, right? We're talking about losing a third, you know, two thirds, 90%, 70%. So even though when we drive around California, it still looks kind of cool, right? It's like, oh my God, it's pretty. We have, you know, Malibu Coast looks cool. Going to San Inez Valley is cool. Go up to Santa Paula is cool, right? It's not, the world hasn't ended. It's not like, like the world's done but it's important for you to understand how much this has changed. And because we allow our baselines to shift, we assume that what we saw when we were a kid is cool, even though that was already highly changed. Okay, and, the, and all kinds of fragmentation going on. Okay, so quick review of what we just went over today. So um, uh, this idea of shifting baselines or sliding baselines, shifting baselines, sliding baselines, you can use either term. Really, really key. We need to acknowledge that as we go throughout the semester, we need to always be checking ourselves to make sure we're not falling into a, a shifted baseline trap and assuming a degraded thing is in fact well functioning. Next, we talked about uh, the footprint of humans. Uh, the, one of the key themes is that our, the footprint of humanity is now threatening our biosphere. That's the scale at which we're operating. Um, how, ultimately, that comes from the number of people and how intensively we use resources. Um, and then we went over some of these key themes. So many of our resources are overexploited. Um, oftentimes, we have poor temporal scale in terms of understanding of what's going on with our, with our population of, or community of concern. Similarly, when we propose interventions, we oftentimes are developing them at much smaller spatial scales than we maybe want to apply them. History can be a good predictor, but it isn't necessarily a good predictor of, of what's going to happen or how things will play out. Short-term thinking often trumps the long-term thinking and in, in calculation and investment. This is an ethical endeavor. We need to make sure, and, 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 and an effective endeavor. This is not some academic exercise where somebody's gonna write papers and say, we should have done this. This is about producing real change in the world and making the world better, more verdant, more just. And so therefore, we need to make sure that we're aligning these things outside of just quote unquote pure biology to make sure this stuff is gonna work. Economic incentives, policies, community engagement, all of that stuff. 
what else? Uh, we need to be comfortable that we oftentimes have imperfect data. We don't have enough. We don't have all the things measured we'd like to have measured. We try, but we just have to make the call sometimes with imperfect info. And then lastly, this isn't a time for despair, right? So, so we can still write this ship. We can still make things better, but it ain't going to happen if we just start to wallow in how, oh my God, you know, doomerism and all that crap. So this is also a positive um, endeavor, and this is a, a self-empowering discipline where we're choosing to say, screw that, we're going to make it better. We're not just going to listen to all the bad, the bad, the bad, the bad. We're going to hear the bad. We need, to, we, need to, we need to hear that with open ears. But then we're going to take that and do some good with that. Cool? All right, questions about any of that stuff? <laughs>